Welcome to the Startups Roundtable podcast, where we discuss the science and art of startups with founders and the broader startup community. I'm Tony Hackett, and I've spent over a third of my B2B sales career either working for early stage startups or as a go-to-market and social selling mentor for founders and their teams. In each episode, we will explore various topics, including decision-making, team-building, and growth strategies. Before we meet today's guest, I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. Here in Sydney, it's the Gadigal people. We pay respect to elders past, present, and emerging, and extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attending today. Productivity is critical for growth. With the constant pressure to deliver, startups can often be overwhelmed by their workloads and end up drifting from their core value proposition. Not the case with Ladago, where they have built an innovative platform that helps businesses bring real-time efficiencies to their business engagement and collaboration setting processes, ultimately helping them focus on growth, not on labour-intensive work. I am joined today by Ladago co-founder Ivan Grisdale to take us inside this exciting company. So let's get to Ivan. Ivan, it's fantastic to have you on the podcast today. Really appreciate you taking the time. To get us underway, could I ask you to tell us a bit about yourself and what you're up to right now? Yeah, for sure. So it's great to be here uh, today, Tony. Thank, thanks for having me. So um, currently, I'm a co-founder and chief revenue officer at uh, a business called Ladogo. Very simply, it's a tool that allows you to send your e- uh, send emails with your calendar directly integrated inside the email. Always displays your real time live availability for the recipients. It's just two clicks, and they can actually book a meeting without ever leaving their inbox. Essentially, so it's super efficient. Less friction gets more meetings, and at the moment, it's the only one on on, on the market. Um, so it's really brand new technology. Ivan, how did you go from the point of seeing the opening in the market and then deciding to take the step to go and actually push forward with this with your own startup? Yeah, it's it's a good question. And in fact, I wasn't one of the original founders um, of the business. There was um, two two other um, key founders to the business. Um, one of them in particular is the CEO uh, and uh, our CTO, actually Mustafa. He's been in technology for around 20 years. He specialized in email and tech for the last 10 years, and he's been building Lodogo for uh, about the last two years. I met up with the business through my own endeavors. I actually reached out to me. I do a lot of mentoring, consulting to various businesses, as well as having set up lots of businesses myself over the last few years. Um, and they reached out to me on a consulting basis. I love the tool, love the technology. It's disruptive. It's brand new. And we had fantastic synergies. And one thing led to another. They invited me to join the board and come on, um, you know, as a CRO and, uh, and co-found. We officially launched, I guess, probably in April of this year, as far as the go-to-market. And everything's just been, um, you know, accelerating since then, really. So, yeah, so it wasn't your typical ordinary, I've gone out and set up a business, which I've done in previous times gone by. But yeah, it's uh, it's been great. It's been really interesting. What's the difference been between stepping into the startup and actually being in? What have been a couple of the things that have really caught your attention and, and made you maybe one a bit more excited than you thought you would be? And what's maybe a challenge that, that appeared a little bit taller than it looked from the outside? Yeah, fair, fair, fair question, actually. So I guess, you know, when, when you're um, looking in from the outside, obviously you give lots of advices and you can see certain things and lots of experiences that you can share and, you know, suggestions as to how you may want to go about things. But it often is very different than when you're actually in the business as opposed to working on the business, as they say. And you're actually carrying out those functions. You know, things get very busy. There's a lot of things to juggle and manage at the same time. Not everything works according to plan. And obviously, you have to factor around those things. The tools obviously make things very streamlined and efficient. There's definitely a difference between, you know, working on your business and working in your business. Do you use data more now that you're in the business than looking from outside and bringing advice and intuition to the frame? Yeah, absolutely. So once you, for example, we've been in lots of events recently, been speaking to lots of people, generating lots of leads. Naturally, all of that data has to then go into a CRM uh, and other places. And then you have to start action in that CRM. So, you know, when you're talking about your, your you know, you're booking your meetings, your follow ups, all the interactions, uh, what are the requirements, uh, et cetera, of the prospects and, and clients. Um, so for sure, there's lots of data to, to gather and make sense of and then actually work out action plans, um, you know, next steps and what to do with that. I know you've been to a few events recently. If you look back to pre-COVID to now, anything that stood out from a, an event, the way they've been set up and run? 
Absolutely. So for me, one of the biggest things that I've noticed uh, pre-COVID, you know, everybody was in the usual um, business as usual sort of mindset. So, you know, um, exhibitors would go along to sell their products. And if you went along and, you know, tried to show that your tool to them, for example, you know, often you'd hit a brick wall and that sort of that interest is. But it's quite strange now since losing two years through COVID and now events have, you know, started happening in a full on sort of context. What I have noticed at every event that I've been to over the last couple of months is everybody seems to be far more common far more interested to actually just genuinely speak to people, um, listen to each other, give each other some time and actually hear what people are offering. Because for two years, there's been a loss in a lot of respects around, you know, connectivity, what products and services are out there for, you know, for me, for my business, for example. And just that bringing the people together has really just opened up the opportunity. But the only way you do that is by having a genuine conversation and giving people the time to speak and listen and hear and, 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 and absorb. And I've definitely, you know, noticed that across all the events without, without question of it's a really interesting point. I must say, when I found your product and got to make contact with you, it felt like I was looking at and understanding a specialist product. And I mean that in all the best ways. And over the last couple of years, I feel as though there have been a number of generalist tools that by and large, we've all muddled through with. And as we've gotten through that and sort of popped our heads back up now, it feels like those generalist tools where we've been forced to average down, they will still have a place in the market. But it felt as though what you're bringing to the market, what you've brought to the market with a very clear view of your audience and the business value that you're wanting to deliver, not just a capability. Could you give a a view into how you think through product development and R&D and and really getting that voice of your customer now and into the the Horizon 1, Horizon 2? I've been around for a little while as well, Tony, and I've seen, you know, the SaaS industry, if you like, grow grow itself up over the last eight and 10 years, really. You know, software has been around, you know, uh, for many, many years, 25 years, internet, Microsoft, all the rest of it, as we know. But the SaaS, the SaaS industry really grew up overnight. And you know, I remember sort of eight to 10 years ago, there was probably around 200 providers of SaaS solutions on the global marketplace. Now I think there's getting on for 15 to 1800. So, you know, in my opinion, some time ago, we already reached saturation points in the SaaS industry. And now there's massive overlap and I was in a, a meeting yesterday actually with somebody showing uh, the current sort of landscape in a diagram and it's absolutely you know shocking to see the overlap of all of these tools um, in all sectors in all you know whether it's marketing sales customer success whatever area of the business you know that you're looking at there's too much overlap and now we've seen probably in the last two or three years businesses that have sprung up they're actually now looking at what softwares are you using so on average you know from what I've seen most businesses use somewhere between 8 and 15 bits of tech in their tech stack Clearly, there's overlap. Clearly, there's things they're paying for and not using, for example. And these companies that have sprung up now are actually analysing, well, what are you using? Where is the overlap? What is the double expenditure that you have? What do you need to lose? What can, What's working for you effectively? Or what do you need to replace? And all those kind of questions. So that, that's a clear indicator that we've gone beyond the saturation points. Now, the problem is, is how do we get rid of what we probably don't really want and shouldn't be paying for? And there's not actually being used and it's not effectively you know, any uh, adding any value to the business. And I think we're going to see more of that now over the next two, three and five year period, actually, and we'll see um, consolidation, as we've seen in lots of other industries. I've certainly seen that financial services in, in time gone by. And I think what happens in the middle of that is um, people niche down, as you, as you say. You know, you can serve, um, you can have a tool that serves all, but to usually make it, make it successful, I often hear that, you know, you really need to niche down, look at um, specific use cases, specific reasons to actually use it and look at the, you know, the outcomes that that's going to produce. And I think there are certainly some providers now that have, have realize that and actually instead of you know serving everybody they're literally just focusing on one key thing and they're blowing that part of the market up um, it's the same with the logo you know we all know there's solutions out there that offer booking links for example to book meetings it is in my opinion old-fashioned technology yes Ladogo still gives you them booking links so if you want to share them through linkedin or whatsapp etc but you know email in fact i was having this conversation at one of the events just uh, last week is um, email is a hugely untapped market it's been around for many years there's 2.1 billion email users users on the planet today. On average, apparently, we I think we send about 4 billion emails on a daily basis. People that are in business roles tend to receive about 120 emails on a daily basis, which is a stat I saw recently. Can't quite remember where it was. And that, if you think about it, that's a hugely untapped audience, a hugely untapped source that's been around forever and is massively underutilized. So for the likes of um, Ladogo's technology, you use an actionable messaging AMP technology where you can send something, you know, calendar directly integrated inside that email, potentially 
potentially opens up that channel that's been just sitting there and been unused for many, many years. And again, it's just finding that niche to utilize something and make it far more efficient in a very simple way, both for the sender and for the recipients to get a meeting But All environments, all, all sales roles, all marketing, everything always leads to how do you get in front of the eyeballs? How do you get in front of your prospects to sell them whatever it is that you're selling them? However you look at it, the number one objective is firstly to have a meeting with them, however that's going to happen. So to be able to schedule that you know, efficiently is a big motivator, a big driver. The technology has been built by Google and they've done their own research and they've confirmed that you know, using this technology, you can get up to 60% more confirmed bookings. That's Google saying that. So I think they're good indicators to uh, look at to say why you should think about niching down and, and focusing on what you're good at and actually being very good at a pain point or fixing a pain point for the end user essentially. And I think that's we're going to see more of those trends going forwards. It's a really powerful statistic. And when I look at the market now, just the broader market, people saying it's difficult to recruit, difficult to employ. And if that's the case, then how do you bring efficiency out of what you already have? So being able to actually drive that efficiency from existing sales teams or customer support teams or customer success teams, that's pretty amazing. The one thing that caught my mind, though, as I was looking at what you do, I figured if you were talking to a manager, even if they didn't know the 60% statistic you just shared, a manager could only agree with your story. And then if the thought was, well, how do we get our teams to do this? I then started to think about the actual process and the change in behavior. Is that actually a bridge you need to cross or am I missing something in your story? Yes, yeah, so, so some of it potentially is, you know, in changing environments, you know, um, you know, we've, we've looked at what COVID did globally. We've seen the past global recession back in 2007, 2008, you know, and off big events, off the back of big events like this, we often see changes of requirements and changes of need and often changes forced upon us. Like Darwin's old phrase, um, I always go back to it's, you know, it's not the smartest or the strongest of the species that tends to survive. It's the most adaptable. Um, and I've seen that ring through my entire career in many different Different ways. And if you move for change, you can do some great things. If you're resistant and, and you don't move with change, then often you'll get left behind. In, in lots of respects. So I think, you know, for, for the workforce, for, for, for the people in all of our businesses, I think everybody really needs to have that open mind and the willingness and the ability to embrace change and go with it. And that's whether it's a small business or whether it's, you know, a global business. And I've worked in both sort of environments. And the problem is the same. It doesn't matter how big or small you are or what the infrastructure is or, or how well you're funded, etc. The problem is dynamically are very much identical. But I think, you know, as an example, with our tool, Ladogo, you know, uh, it's all about where you use it as well. So one thing, is adaptability and being able to use it. But if it's if it's easy, if it's accessible through all sources, so for example, we integrate with the top six global CRMs at the moment uh, as a native plugin. Uh, so it's really quick and easy to get it from the marketplace and just use it within your working environment, you know, your CRM that you use at the moment. We API into other CRMs as well, so that's easy. And a couple of weeks ago, we just launched another well first where you can actually use Ladogo from any mail client. So you can use it just directly from Gmail, Outlook, 365, etc. So you don't even need to be using a CRM, which some businesses don't use CRM as we know. So the ability to use the tool that's going to get you the results from multiple environments in multiple different ways that you choose to work also is a huge advantage that the software should be offering, but also the user is demanding at the same time. So I think if you can do those things, still while focusing on your niche, your pain points that you're solving becomes super useful and personalized to all users. Are any industries more early adopters than others for you, or is it truly a horizontal yeah, that's a great question as well, Tony. So I guess, you know, if you look at the s software industry and everybody that's involved in it, you know, I'd certainly say we've been more susceptible and open uh, to new tools and new technologies and using them, etc. Since the birth of the internet and then over the last sort of 10 or 15 years when broadband has become much more accessible globally for everybody instead of all DSL and dial-up modems and these kind of things, um, that's accelerated all of that, I think. If you look at the legal profession, um, I, I used to sell into the legal profession profession a number of years ago and it was often said to me by people in the legal profession that they tend to be two to three years behind everybody else in adoption of, uh, of new ideas new technologies and new things in general actually and that's obviously because they've got a quite rigid process you know to, to adhere to as well you know financial services is, uh, has been quite similar in some contexts but in other contexts you know it's been super fast so for trading environments for example been lots of mobile apps cryptocurrencies all of these kind of things have sprung up over the last few years but there's certain elements within financial services that are still stuck 
stuck where they were 20 years ago. And I've seen that and seen very little change in those. Whilst, yes, there's been innovations come to market, not everybody in, in certain parts of financial services world have wanted to even consider or adopt those. You know, they're, they're very much focused on this, this is how we do things and it's n- never likely to change. But a lot of that also comes down to the workforce itself and the demographic of the workforce and the people that are working in that, what their station is and those kind of things. Often in businesses, I find it's the people that actually cause the resistance most of all, in fact, in, in most cases. You link back to my point a little bit earlier and you put it very nicely, actually, and that is how do people's behaviours get challenged and then how do they adapt to that? And we think about over the last couple of years, we were all working from home before then, or many of us, but certainly over the last two years, we certainly have. As we move back into the office or in the hybrid world, Ivan, if you're working from the office three days a week and I'm working from the office three days a week, no one should assume we're there in the same three days, which puts a greater opportunity to drain every bit of productivity efficiency out of teams through what you're able to offer. So I think that if it had its day before the day that is demanded for it now, and I I can see a point where what we're discussing today, we won't even be talking about it because it will just be the way that we function. And I hadn't thought about what you do in a way that almost disregards CRM. And that's not what you said, but the point about it being integrated with CRM, there's power in that. But the power is, in fact, it's about collaboration and it's about teams and it's about efficiencies and about productivity. And there must be some KPIs that are special to each industry, but I expect that 60%, that just keeps ringing in my ears from the point you made earlier. So I think that there's demographics come into it as well. You just mentioned that. And as I was thinking about our conversation today, I started to wonder, are there some demographics regardless of of industry or regardless of role inside an organization who would embrace this faster than others? I'm guessing that's something that you're seeing as well. If you grow up, I think, in an era or an age that has all of this, you know, what's perceived as the latest current super technology, I think you're naturally more exposed to it and you just absorb it in a very different way. If you're, you know, estranged to that or, or you're, you're, you've not been used to that type of environment, should we call it, then sometimes, you know, you might not absorb that in the same way. So I definitely think there's lots of different factors that we could probably break down and, and, and think about that have a part to play in the adoption of that. But I think you know, if I, if I look back in time 20 years ago, for example, before, you know, when people were still saying, Oh, what, what's the internet? That's never going to work. And people did say that. And there was no broadbands. There was, if you're out on the road, all you had was a, a Nokia 3310 phone, for example, and you had fax minder to get information faxed to you because there was no such thing as email, for example, back then. And our part of a sales team that we traveled all over the country and we'd pull up to a new city and we'd go into a hotel and we'd ask the receptionist, do you mind if I get a fax sent to your fax machine? And they'd be like, how do you do that? Well, just give me a phone number and I'll show you. And then suddenly, Suddenly, we'd have 30 pages of a fax printed off on their machine and we'd go about. That was like the equivalent of receiving an email with all of the information to go and visit a prospect in today's day and age, uh, as an example. But one of the biggest drawbacks, actually, was the downtime between meetings. There was lots of driving to be done, let's say, from meeting to meeting um, in a face-to-face environment. And when you'd arrive, you'd either, you know, you'd arrive late, you'd lose all of the downtime when really you're traveling. And the technology just, just didn't exist to be able to do anything else in the, in the meantime. Whereas nowadays, if you were doing that same same journey you can have a laptop you can have your smartphone you can have your in you know your um, apple pay all of this you know connected uh, connectivity whilst you're on the go and you can do so much more from a productivity perspective in those down periods that you've got in between time and become more efficient so it's, it's a complete sort of you know difference i even think sometimes if you look at you know the last 20 years i, I also ask the question have we actually become more productive um, in reality, even though we've got all of this new technology and, uh, you know, abilities and capabilities. In some ways, I, I feel that we haven't. You know, I spoke with a business two weeks ago um, in financial services, and they operate what we used to call a telesales division, which is now sales development reps and business development reps nowadays, you know, new, new terminologies. But essentially, it was a telesales unit booking meetings for a field sales team that would go out and visit prospects. And ironically, you know, even now, they still have exactly the same challenges as I faced 20 years ago, even with all of the current technologies. And we're talking to them about Ladogo at the moment and, you know, what's the potential for booking meetings and simplifying that for both the telesales and the face-to-face salesperson to get meetings into their diary and do that efficiently. And even, you know, with um, satellite navigation on your phone, et cetera, nowadays, their biggest challenge is the routing. How do we route a team of people around the country at the right time in different locations, but keep the costs down, you know, keep the traveling down, etc. And it's the same conundrum that, you know, I, I saw 20 years ago. So whilst technology can absolutely enhance certain areas of it, it doesn't necessarily always fix the whole problem. 
And again, that comes back to the niche down point um, that we talked about earlier, I guess, is look at where are, the, where are the real pain points and can you make a change? Can you make a difference to fix that real problem area? Because you're never going to fix everything. That, that's the reality, I think. Leadership comes in many forms and in many ways. And when a manager is given the responsibility of leadership, they need to understand the things that you're speaking about and then how to enact that and to coach and to bring people through that path. And this whole thing about the business process needs to recognize the value, not just a person or a buyer or a a team. No doubt that's a good place to start. But the moment it becomes cultural is the moment that the productivity will start to show up in an annual report for a financial service organization or whatever it might be. But you still need to have the champion to drive the change, I'm guessing. And that's in your sales pursuits. It's not just about identifying the problem, but finding that champion if I put my consulting or my business transformation hat on, when you look at some businesses, you know, startups tend to have very agile approaches, very um, keen people in the team. And often, you know, as with any team, you know, it's the ones that are really good at things tend to do lots of the winning, for example. But that, that also involves mindset, uh, culture um, and abilities and all those kind of things together. If you look at some other businesses, you know, whilst you've got all of those things, sometimes there can be a legacy that carries itself through that can also be a preventer from changing the business within your individuals and the business processes as well and you're absolutely right you need to look across the business and it probably takes a certain type of individual or individuals with experiences and skill sets to be able to look in the right places look for the right things understand what they're seeing and to bring in alternatives uh, as solutions to be able to remedy or fix or cure or, or completely change altogether, you know, to make those business processes better, far more efficient for the business itself. And along that journey, it's all about taking the the people um, along that journey as well. There's always resistance, but we're all human. We've always, always got a blocker at some point, but usually it's about sharing the knowledge and sharing the value of this is the situation at the moment. If we do this, this, and this, this is how it could change. And this could be the positive impact. Yes, there might be a pain point or a change point to go through if we can get to the other side of that look what it'll do for the business and actually look what it'll do for yourself as an individual or as a team from a progression point of view uh, and look at you know what else we can do then after that but it's taking people and the business through those journeys um, is the key and it's often a big challenge Um, you know I remember probably 10 or 15 years ago you know people um, that had uh, multitudes of experience you know they've been working with different companies etc if they were out there looking for a new role it was very much frowned upon oh you've you know you've job hopped you've only been here for three years or four years why have you not been there for five years and ten years and it was seen as as a problem um, in actual fact whereas I think now you Having gone through last, you know, a recession in 08 and COVID, and I think people are now beginning to realise the breadth of knowledge and breadth of experience and um, examples to be able to draw from often is the one thing that's missing to be able to fix their own challenges and problems that they're faced with. So there seems to be certainly over the last two or three years more of an appetite, you know, from a people person point of view, reaching out to to that broad skill set. And not every business, not every person is able to move at the same rate of change as well. But the key is about instigating the change and starting the momentum and then everything tends to snowball uh, whether you want it to or not once that ball's rolling things tend to build and you can build upon that from there later on i think Ivan, it's, it's tremendous and you've shared some wonderful insights on working within a startup and growing and and driving into new fields so i wonder if i could ask you to close for us by giving some uh, knowledge experiences tips around mentors and coaches and especially if there were some early stage founders that were listening and looking for some guidance on making that decision or to find that best mentor or coach what would you offer up gosh that's uh that's an interesting question tony so i think there's, pro- there's probably two things i think you really want somebody that's going to be um, objective factual probably don't want somebody that's going to be opinionated or bit everybody comes with their opinions but you really want somebody to be able to look at the bare facts look at the you know the inputs and the outputs across all of the different areas to try and figure out what's going on at the moment and then offer up some suggestions as to, to how that can be changed often i think it depends also who who in the business is actually looking for that uh, mentorship or that advice. Ideally, if it's the person at the top, that's always great. But you need uh, autonomy, needs to be in, 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 in play, and you need the ability to go across the business to understand, really connect with everybody and ask everybody what's their thoughts, their vi- feelings, their views, uh, really to get a true feel of the heartbeat across the business, I think. I think once you, once you do that, you can begin to think about making changes in the right areas. Um, I think without that, it can be uh, a preventer. And often sometimes, you know, it can even be that senior person who's hired 
you in the first place can actually be the problem in actual fact that needs to change for the sake of the business. Sometimes it can be the leadership team or, you know, it can be people in the business, not just the structure or the processes. So I, th- I think it's a difficult one. For me, from my experience, you know, w- working with um, different leaders, I think the ability to take critique and take it constructively and try to think about this isn't about me, this is about what's being done or what the process is or what the outcomes it is that it's either producing or not producing and trying to look at it objectively is the key. So I think it's, I th- I think it's always going to be a challenge. Wonderful reflection about uh, focusing on the business value and the, I guess, the, the customer engagement more so than the actual person and the person's style. But by staying focused on the output, it makes a rallying point out of any mentoring or coaching. Uh, Ivan, thanks so much for, for joining me today. It's terrific to hear the story. And it feels as though we've only scratched the surface on on your story and be wonderful to stay in touch. And maybe even if uh, you had the opportunity for us to check in at a later date, but I appreciate you joining me today. For sure. Thank you very much for having me, Tony. And I guess for all of the listeners today, if you're interested about Lodogo, just go to lodogo.com and uh, we can book a meeting and have a show and tell. So yeah, there's my plug. (laughs) Terrific. Well done. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Feedback is always welcome. And I would appreciate introductions to potential future guests to invite onto the podcast. But that's it for today. Thanks for listening and bye for now.